Better shake your booties for black girl nerds. It is a pleasure to be with you both. I the time Reeknik, the wildest party never told. It was exciting to watch. I will get. I yes. <laughs> 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 so I'm. I'm actually smile watching. on your face. You got a big <laughs> smile on your face. <laughs> I mean, Literally. everything from the music to just learning about you know something that is part of Black culture. It was. It was. It was cool. It was. It was a good time. And I'm wondering when you guys heard that they were making a Freak Neck documentary, what were your initial thoughts? And we can start with you, Jermaine. Well, I mean, they weren't making it before we got involved. Um, it was a conversation about an idea. And then, you know, um, uh, from what Luke's saying is that he, they had the conversation first and then Luke brought told them they had to get me. Then they came and had a conversation with me. And I was basically saying the same thing. If Luke, you know what I mean? If Luke ain't going to be involved, I'm not going to do it. And they told me we got Luke. And I was like, okay, now it's official. Because, you know, I I I was a younger person in, in Atlanta in 93, I think, when people were saying this. Um, Criss Cross had just come out. Um, so I probably was 93. I was 20 years old, 19 or 20 years old. I wasn't actually old enough. I wasn't legal, basically. You, you know, so I couldn't really do any of the things inside the nightclubs and all of that extra stuff. So I was one of the guys or uh, one of the participants in the traffic and creating the traffic and just playing my music and watching everybody and parking lot pimping, as we call it. Um, <laughs> and that's that's basically what was happening. So, but in that in that space. In that time, all I heard was Uncle Luke. You know what I mean? All I heard was two live crew and all of this music from down from 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 Florida, basically. Mm. And um, from my my memory was that. So I was just like, if we're gonna do this, I need to make sure that we gotta have him there so he could tell us. And and he it wasn't just his music was being played in Atlanta. He was actually in Atlanta. He was coming to the city. So I wanted to know me personally what was what was the dynamic and what brought him to the city and what, what you know what what had him because he was he in in scar he calls out bankhead mm -hmm. bankhead bounce he talks about this in the song and i'm like he's not even from atlanta to do that atlanta had to have a very big impact on his career in order for him to name that to say that in that song so yeah. i had a lot of questions just me being a person a, a lover of hip-hop and the person involved so i, I couldn't wait to sit and talk to luke Awesome. And I mean, it's the 40th anniversary, or I mean, we just wrapped up the 40th anniversary of Freak Nick, 50th anniversary of hip hop. And I think I read 30th anniversary of So So Deaf. Um, 30th last year. Last year. Okay. And what are you hoping that this film will do for the Black community, for the Black culture? And we can start with you, Uncle Luke. Well, I, I, I would hope uh, this film, you know, first of all, this film tell the real story about Freaknik, you know, because, you know, the average person would go and Google Freaknik or anybody thinking about Freaknik, they think about it from the standpoint of this wild and crazy party, people jumping on cars, dancing and all that. You know, when you look at some of the things that are going on today in society, you know, uh, cities like Miami Beach banning Black College Spring Break, you know, and you think about those things and it brings you back to where you was, where where your mindset was when Freaknik was going through his troubles in Atlanta. And so where I, where I would like for people to take out of this is the fact that when you look at this event, you had some young folks who band together and they wanted to have a party. You know, mm -hmm. they were college students uh, from Atlanta. They came, they had a party. The party went from one thing to the next it became a outdoor festival and then you know uh, again with the height of the music and driven by the music and driven by uh, uh a lot of different elements a lot of people came to atlanta you know with no with no organization as far as uh programming and then it turned into a bad situation government got involved and you know when the government gets involved you know black people have a tendency of ended up becoming the villains in the whole situation. And so I want people to 
look at this rich history of this documentary and under, get a clear understanding as to the things that we go through today, right now in society, uh, black young folks, uh, look at it from the standpoint of how far we came, where we're at right now, uh, at the same time, how far the city of Atlanta came, you know, and when you when you think about it, you think about JD's contribution and how how uh, he is the mayor and how uh, impactful what he did, you know, in Atlanta, and then take his take a whole side of his business and dedicate it to Freak Nick from a musical standpoint of it. I mean, you know, and and being the soundtrack of it all and driven, you know, the, I mean, the the, the South. During those times where we're, we're uh, like we are right now, we were left out of the conversation when it came to hip hop. Uh, so when you look at this documentary, like I say, one of many other projects, we, this be the first time we express ourselves and where we came from, our culture. And it, and it has to start uh, with Atlanta because everybody in the world, you know, they came to Atlanta and they stayed when they, when they went to Freak Nick. You know, and Atlanta became this mecca of entertainment as it is right now today, as we all know it, it, it to be. And so you kind of now start getting the, the stories of how Atlanta became what it is, how hip hop in the South is so significant to, to the music industry and how we became who we are because of Freak Nick. I mean, we, we, in our wildest dreams, neither one of us sitting there saying, okay, we, he's going to do the all-star record. I'm going to do uh, some videos at Freak Nick and do this music and have these parties. And then 40 years later, we'll be sitting right here talking to you all about it. But that's the beauty of, of the music industry that mm -hmm. we can, uh, we can clean up some of the misconceptions of what Freak Nick was really about. You know, we can, Tell you young folks, no, you didn't in invent twerking. Uh, it was booty shaking. Uh, and you all could then have a real, oh, oh, this this ain't just started. You know, Drake didn't invent this. No, this was invented back then. And so you'll see a whole bunch of those type of stories in uh, this doc, which you've already saw. Yes. And I enjoyed. Thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. Uh, I can't even say how big a fan I am of both of you guys, your music and everything. So thank you so much. Thank you. And keep that smile on your face. Oh, thank you. <laughs> hey, Kat. How are you guys? Shout out to black girls and the better nerds then. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Freak Nick, the wildest party never told. Until now. Until now, exactly. Uh, <laughs> Geraldine, now. why do you think some folks might be a little hesitant or worried about this film coming out? I think, you know, at that time, people were young and free and didn't weren't always aware of the cameras around the way that we, we are now. Mm -hmm. um, and so <laughs> I think naturally people are scared to see themselves back when they were young because they weren't expecting anyone to see them. They were very much in that moment. Right. And then, so I'm wondering, uh, P. Frank, where did you pull this archival footage from? What was this research process like for you? Well, no, I mean, obviously you can check on the internet and YouTube. There's a bunch of Freak Nick videos. We put the APB bat signal out um, with Luke Campbell and Jermaine Dupree and then myself and other people and people started sending us stuff. And mm -hmm. it just was really lucky, you know, because I really wanted, I think Geraldine and I and the rest of the crew wanted to make sure that we had stuff in there that nobody had ever seen which I think we did a pretty good job of unearthing their stuff that people have seen, but there's quite a bit that nobody ever saw. So um, people were still trying to send me footage even after we were done. So there's a lot of your aunties and uncles who got some high aids or camcorder or, you know, whatever it might be. <laughs> I love that. I actually asked my mom about it and she pretended like she didn't know what I was talking about, but I, I, know, <laughs> I know better. Right, I'll be watching. <laughs> Why you do your mom like that? Mom, mom, moms, moms just want to have fun. <laughs> Uh, so what was the original goal with, you know, making this documentary and with the final version out and shared with the public, do you think you achieved that goal or did it change at some point? And this is for you, P. Frank. Um, well, no, I think we achieved the goal of creating a film. You know, I've heard pretty good reviews from it. It's always good to get 
positive feedback. I'm sure there's going to be some people who don't like it. Mm-hmm. But I do think, generally speaking, it, it is a great piece of work. And, um, you know, Freaknik is, is, is sort of like this tapestry of all these different things. And so, to me, we sort of lured you in with the party and the turn up and the whatever. But if you watched it, there's a, a lot of other things that it's about. So, hopefully, we did that as well. So, Freaknik is just sort of this mythological thing that a lot of people didn't really know. There's a few documentaries that, that were out there, but I think this is probably the most comprehensive and high level examination of Freak Nick. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then Geraldine, last question, you know, there's this idea that social media now because of social media events like this can't happen. And I'm just wondering, how do you think social media has changed the hip hop scene or even black culture in general? Wow. That's a very good question. I think that um, everything just feels a lot more accessible and inaccessible in a way, right? Um, We get things instantly. And so there's a constant crave to put things out. And sometimes that might affect the quality of the things, right? If we're constantly demanding and consuming, um, you kind of become a little desensitized to the things that are um, being put out there. So I think that that's, you know, a way that social media really plays into that Mm. social media huh that's a trip i mean i think uh uh you know i wasn't worried about posting in 92 when i was trying to get a number from a girl like passing it to a car you know i wasn't really worried about that part you know we were just in the moment and i do think that a lot of the in the momentness of what was happening back in those 90s and 80s time is missing today people you know i go to concerts sometimes i see artists performing and nobody is dancing everybody is trying to film it you know what i mean and i think that that part is unfortunate. I mean, I've done it myself too, so I'm equally guilty, but I do try to be in the moment. And I wish that more people in this generation did that part, enjoyed things and just enjoyed the music and the culture, so. Yeah. Well, thank you both. This has been great. Fantastic, thank you. Shout out all the nerds, all the black girl nerds. Woo woo, woo. (laughs) (laughs) Have a good one. You too. Nerds. Better shake your booties for black girl nerds.